Good afternoon. We are here from Chicago at American Heart Association Scientific Session, and I'm here with Don Lloyd Jones to talk to you about risk assessment. I'm Donna Arnett, past president of the American Heart Association. So, Don, what are the headlines here in risk assessment? Well, as you know, uh, we were very pleased to present the 2018 guidelines for cholesterol management, which are brand new. Um, and for risk assessment, there's actually simultaneously published online a document that's, that dives deep into risk assessment and really explains our approach in much greater detail because it's such an important part of primary prevention for cardiovascular disease. I think the take home message here is really that uh, risk assessment is a process. It's not just a calculation. You, it's not a one and done, plug in the numbers and get your answer. Um, it never has been, but I think what we were able to provide this time in the guidelines is much more uh, meat on the bones. And the headlines are, risk assessment is not just a calculation, it's a process. And there are really three steps. It starts with estimating the risk using the 10-year risk calculator so that you get a ballpark figure that starts a conversation. Step two is personalizing that risk, meaning what are the features of the individual patient sitting in front of you that color that initial risk estimate? For example, um, are they from a race ethnic group where we know that actually they're at higher risk than baseline? Um, that would be perhaps people of South Asian ancestry. Or um, do they have a strong family history? Do they have chronic kidney disease? These individual patient factors would color the risk estimate upwards and maybe put someone more firmly into the intermediate risk group, let's say. Um, other features, though, might actually suggest that we should downshift the risk a little bit. Um, if it's someone who is of high socioeconomic status or particularly engaged with the health system for a long period of time, we would actually downshift the risk a little bit. So once that process of uh, personalizing the risk estimate is done, um, in the context of a, a discussion between the doctor and the patient, um, it's very important then to decide have we uh, reached a common ground where we think this really is a patient who's going to benefit from a statin medication to reduce their risk? If there's still clinical uncertainty or if the patient's undecided, the third step is, then is trying to reclassify that risk. And what we've done is provide firm recommendations around using coronary artery calcium scoring in order to try to reclassify patients' risks. So if you have an intermediate risk patient, get the coronary artery calcium score. If that score turns out to be zero, it turns out it dramatically reclassifies their risk downwards. These are patients who are at substantially lower risk, and the decision for a statin can actually be deferred in that situation. We, we provide a nice recommendation about that. If the coronary calcium score is actually over 100, that's clearly a patient who's going to benefit. So you've further reclassified the risk upward, and that's a patient where we would strongly recommend a statin. And in that middle range of about 1 to 99 calcium score, clinical judgment and, and deciding with the patient whether today's the day because they do have atherosclerosis or should we repeat the calcium score in perhaps three to five years to see if it's changing rapidly. Well, Don, I know this is an area of real concern for patients, a, an area that's hard, I think, as a patient to understand. So it's really great that we're able now with these new tools like coronary calcium to help patients with their physicians and clinicians make those decisions. So how does this differ from 2013? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's a question we've been getting a lot. You know, I think that the basis for risk assessment um, hasn't changed all that much from 2013, but we've really fleshed out how you go through the process of risk assessment. So that initial risk estimate, there are a lot of great tools available uh, to help people start the conversation. Um, we've provided these what we call risk enhancing factors that might push you more towards a decision on statin therapy. Those are the things I mentioned like chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome. Um, and then that final step going through uh, coronary artery calcium, much firmer recommendation and much clearer guidance on how to use that when you're actually reclassifying risk for your patients if you and the patient think that's necessary. So for the average patient, how hard is it to get a coronary calcium screening? Is it relatively easy? Is it covered by insurance typically? Yeah, these are important questions, um, and, and I'm glad you asked about that. So coronary artery calcium requires a prescription from your doctor in order to get the test done. It's done in a CT scanner, so not an MRI where sometimes people get a little claustrophobic, uh, but in a, in a pretty open CT scanner. Um, some people ask about the radiation dose. It's actually quite a low radi radiation dose, equivalent to a mammogram, um, or equivalent actually to flying overseas to Europe. Uh, so one flight. So it's, it's very low, consistent with kind of background radiation levels. 
Um, and as for cost, unfortunately, right now, very few uh, insurance companies will cover this. The out-of-pocket expense in most metropolitan areas is between $75 and $200 for most patients. Not nothing, but if it can really help them um, make a decision about lifelong therapy, many patients are willing to think about that. And in truth, we're hopeful that this firm recommendation in the guidelines will actually push payers to start covering this because it really is a test that can make a difference. Well, it's certainly really hard to be in that gray zone and not know as a patient which way to go. Right. So it does offer a, a patient one more tool to help. So saying that, you know, what are the tools that patients can go to um, for information about their own risk score? Yeah, so there are two tools that are available from, uh, e one each from ACC and AHA that start this process, the risk estimator. So there's the ACC ASCVD Risk Estimator Plus. I can't say that that well, but you can Google it pretty easily. Um, and there's also the AHA ASCVD Risk Estimator Tool. Uh, ASCVD is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease but we just shorten it for everybody's sake. Um, so those are available easily uh, found on the web. And you plug in things like your age, sex, race, your blood pressure levels, your cholesterol levels, whether you have diabetes or smoking, uh, and it will give you a 10-year risk estimate for heart attack or stroke risk, and as well, a lifetime risk estimate. So you can really put that in context um, of what your risk might be. It'll also help you compare to someone of your same age, sex, and race group who has kind of optimal levels. So you can see mm, how far off am I mm -hmm. from where I might be at my very best. Uh, so those tools are available for everybody. Um, once um, you kind of move to the next stage, there are a number of nice tools laid out in the guidelines for practitioners to use um, in conjunction with their patients that can help um, to understand how do we have this discussion? What things should we consider uh, in, in thinking about the kind of risk enhancing? Um, and there's a nice website identified from the Mayo Clinic about shared decision making and a couple of other tools um, that are outlined in the document. Finally, there's a really nice website if you choose to get the coronary calcium score called the MESA CAC Tools, uh, M-E-S-A, C-A-C Tools. And there you can actually plug in your, again, age, sex, race, and your coronary calcium score to find out, well, is this high or low for my group? Um, you know, should I have any yet, or am I ahead of my cohort? Um, and I think that's a really wonderful tool to help people actually understand and put that score in context. Oh, well, it's terrific that we have those tools. I, just an anecdote, my husband had a calcium scoring as part of a pilot program for my uh, okay. clinical trial yeah. and went on a statin, and he's been in great shape ever since. So right. it's, it's a great tool and so, so glad to hear that patients now have these things available to them. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think we feel like, um, again, building on the strong uh, basis of 2013, we can now show practitioners and patients much better how to use these things in the real world. And I think that's a huge step forward. Well, thank you. And thank you uh, for joining us today to talk about risk assessment.